Allison, go ahead. And thank you. Thank you. For taking time yeah. Thank you. Um, thanks for having me. Okay. Um, how many of y'all by show of hands are familiar with Texas A&M Forest Service? For those who don't know, um, we are the state forest service. So I know that A&M in there can sometimes confuse people, think we're only located on a college station or that we only serve college station. Um, but we serve the entire state as the state forest service. We are also one of the lead agencies in the state for response to wildfires, as well as all other types of incidents like winter storms or even COVID, um, we helped with response to that as well. Um, in terms of what I do with Texas A&M Forest Service, I specifically work for the Urban and Community Forestry Program. Um, I'm located out of Austin and I cover that nice little region there in Central Texas. Um, I tend to focus on trees in a more landscaped setting, whereas we have other programs that focus on trees in the more natural setting and programs related to oak wilt and wildfire prevention and things of that sort. Um, my primary sort of audience is usually city governments, um, but I also do a lot of education and outreach with anybody, uh, including groups like yourselves um, that are interested in trees. Oops, wrong way. Okay, in terms of what we're going to be doing, uh, today, in terms of what we're going to be discussing, I should say, um, we'll start off talking about, um, this actually isn't the right presentation. Uh, give me a second. <laughs> I was like, we are not talking about tree planting. <laughs> oh, yes, yeah, 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 yeah. This one. The first few slides, though, were the same. I, I just didn't catch. Um, I need to share. Okay. Perfect. Yeah, the rest of that was all the same. This is where we get things that are different. Uh, we're going to start off talking about just sort of the benefits of trees and urban forests, and some of y'all might be well familiar with these, but I always like to start our conversations uh, with sort of this point. Uh, especially when it comes to trying to convince other people who might not be as interested in native plants and trees, um, why they should care about trees and why they should be prioritized. This. Um, then we're going to talk about uh, development and the urban forest and whether they can coexist. Uh, then we'll go to the city or municipal perspective. Um, we'll talk about why that is later, as well as take a kind of a deep dive into some tree regulations in the form of ordinances. And then at the very uh, end of the presentation, we'll talk about like, so what, what's next? Uh, where do we go from here when it comes to uh, protecting trees? I will say that throughout the presentation, I'll probably kind of use protecting and preserving trees um, sort of interchangeably. Um, I'm meaning the same thing when I talk about this. As any good ologist, I have to start with a definition just to make sure that we are all on the same page in terms of what an urban forest is. And to me, in my role, it's all the trees and the associated vegetation where people live. So that's regardless of ownership on private or public property. That's regardless of setting in a landscape setting or in a more natural setting. Um, and when we say urban, to me, all that means is where people are. Um, sometimes the term urban can seem a little foreign to some people. So the term community forest, forest is also used typically to denote places with smaller populations, but we're still talking about the exact same thing. And um, these types of forests, they play a vital role in sustaining our communities. Um, why is that? Well, they make them a whole lot more livable. Um, they create a sense of legacy because for the most part, we hope that the trees would outlive us. They help to create a sense of place. Um, there's this phenomenon that can happen as especially smaller communities develop. They can suffer from what's called placelessness where there's really not as much character in the community. You have all the big box stores um, and you kind of lose that sense of what the community really was. Well, trees can play a big role in preserving that sense of place along with, along with other things. 
Um, and I'm sure that you can think in your mind right now, even too, I know that as I drive across Texas and different places, there are certain communities that I know I'm there once I see those trees. Um, they are also an investment, a wise investment, uh, if done correctly, as well as trees have so many benefits that we're going to talk about. I do also want to acknowledge that for like me, myself, um, why do I think trees and urban forests should be prioritized? Um, to me, trees have just sort of an inherent value. You know, I like trees because they're trees. I don't need all these other reasons. And I'm sure some of you might feel that way as well with your interest in native plants. But there are some other people in the world who need to know the dollar signs beside, behind trees or why they should care about trees. They don't have that sort of innate sense um, that they should be important. So typically when I'm trying to sell trees, to somebody, uh, typically talk about the benefits or the ecosystem services that we get from trees. Um, and we can typically categorize these into three different categories, you know, the social, the economic, the environmental benefits, but there's a whole lot of overlap. And so I just want to go through a few, a small selection of uh, the many benefits, starting with some environmental ones. Or U.S. urban trees remove an estimated 822,000 tons per year of air pollutants. So a lot of people know that, you know, through photosynthesis, we get oxygen, um, but trees are nature's air filters. Um, and they can not only, you know, help the air quality, but then that also is, you know, related to our own human health incidence of asthma as well. Uh, shade, we know that shade from a tree's canopy uh, provides relief, um, which is especially needed where we are in central Texas, but there's also this phenomenon known as the urban heat island. So as development happens, as you take away vegetation and you put in more concrete and more buildings and more built infrastructure, temperatures tend to rise. Urban centers are warmer than um, other areas and trees, not only through shade, but through other mechanisms um, can actually help reduce that effect, that urban heat island effect. You, Probably don't need me to tell you this, but uh, urban trees support wildlife as nesting sites, shelter, and food sources. I live in a relatively new development within the last six or so years in Austin. Um, and each home has its pocket front yard and got, you know, a live oak, a red oak, or a bur oak uh, that was planted at the time of development. And those trees are now starting to get a little bigger, some doing better than others. And last month, I saw my first squirrel. <laughs> which is just like something so weird that you don't think about until you don't see the squirrels on your walk. And um, just an interesting antidote that I wanted to share with you. Um, when it comes to some of the social benefits of trees, there's ample research out there to show that trees and green spaces in nature help to support healing. So there's been studies done where in hospitals, uh, patients with views of trees and green spaces heal faster require less pain medicine than those without. Um, exposure to trees can also be good for your mental health. Um, this is actually a photo from uh, a forest bathing or forest therapy session uh, that we led out at Gem of the Hills, if y'all are familiar with that location. Um, and just, you know, nature in general, as well as trees, um, can be a source of uh, reduced stress for, for us. Uh, trees also go a long way in supporting uh, community and social ties. The idea here is that with the trees, then you're more likely to be outside, then your neighbors are more likely to be outside, and then you meet each other. Um, and then also studies about how, because of that, uh, crime rates can go down as well. Uh, this is a photo from um, an urban food forest in Austin called Festival Beach. Um, smack dad, dab in the middle of the summer, in the middle of the day, we were in that uh, pecan grove there and it was nice and cool. When it comes to the economic benefits, some people need to see the dollar signs behind trees. Um, trees can increase property values by up to, I've seen anywhere from 10 to 30%. This uh, statistic that I got for the presentation said 20, um, but you can imagine just how different that neighborhood would look if you just removed the trees. Uh, it'd be a whole lot hotter as well. Properly placed trees as well can reduce your air conditioning needs. Um, 
Similarly, if it's a tree, if it's a deciduous tree and it loses its leaves and then it allows the sun to shine through in the winter, can also reduce your heating uh, as well. And so again, those are just some of the many benefits that uh, you might need to reference whenever you're talking to somebody about trees, people in your community, about what, why they should care about trees other than just the fact that they are trees. You know, these are some of, some of the reasons um, that we love to see trees in the community. But there's a caveat about this. Uh, large mature trees are better at providing these benefits than other. And this is really important in the context of tree protection or tree preservation, because typically those programs or those regulations are targeted toward those larger trees. Because as you can see here, this is just a theoretical diagram, but in theory, trees, as they mature, they sort of reach this maximum uh, in terms of the benefits that they can provide. Those benefits are maximized, of course, depending on whether they're maintained properly or not. And there are variations within and between species, but the general idea, the bigger, the larger, the more mature trees, those healthy trees are the ones that are going to really give us those benefits. And there's this lag between planting a tree and actually realizing those benefits in a meaningful way. And so this is also important because you can't simply outplant your way out of tree protection. Um, tree protection, protecting those larger trees uh, is important. All right, so let's talk about development and what that means uh, for our urban forests. So this is just general in terms of the US, what are the different causes of urban forest loss and development is typically the number one. Um, but there are other things, right? Uh, things like natural hazards, storms, droughts, hurricanes, ice storms, as well as just how the community perceives trees, uh, whether they see them as a constant hazard, whether they see them as something that just gives them allergies or not as well as there are things like what we call primary pests and pathogens, things that can kill an outright healthy tree. Oak wilt is kind of the one that we suffer a lot from here in Central Texas, but uh, other more sort of national ones that have been struggled with are things like Dutch elm disease um, or emerald ash borer, which they are uh, currently experiencing up in the DFW area. But those are things that can come and kill outright healthy populations of trees. And so when you don't have things like diversity in the urban forest, a single one of those can come and, and take out a, a good percentage of your canopy. I probably also don't need to tell you this, but Texas is growing. Um, this was actually even, you know, right before the pandemic is when this um, diagram is from. But in general, the population of Texas, as well as metropolitan areas specifically, uh, are growing. And so this kind of cascading effect that you get is you have the growing metros, then you have that kind of suburban sprawl, but then you also have the exurban areas or the exurbs that grow. And even in the pandemic, this um, phenomenon of remote work even caused uh, the exurbs to grow you know, potentially more than they normally would. But um, with that growth typically comes with increased development. And that is something that we see, you know, particularly along this sort of I-35 corridor that we have. Next slide. Okay, so growth happens. Um, but is it good or is it bad? You know, from the community's perspective, growth needs to happen for economic reasons. Uh, to bring opportunities to the community. But um, if there's sort of a lack of thoughtful planning or tree preservation practices in place, you know, that development can lead to the loss of trees and therefore that loss of benefits. Or on the other side, uh, if you have sort of sustainable planning and tree preservation practices in place, uh, that can protect trees and then sustain those benefits. Uh, as the community grows. And so there's two different sides and two different paths that uh, communities can go down. Um, in terms of how you would actually uh, protect trees during development, uh, it's all about retraining the right trees. Uh, and what are the right trees? Um, some good examples are high quality stands of native trees. This is a, an image there of a stand of trees as well as protecting individual trees. So uh, preferably though, you want trees in good condition, 
you want a favorable species, ones that particularly uh, can survive development and is more longer lived and just capable of surviving construction. Construction is really hard on trees um, because of the root system. So most people, you know, their average person doesn't really understand what a tree's root system looks like. They think it looks like the mirror image of the top of the tree, when in reality, those roots are relatively shallow within the first foot or so of soil. And for a mature tree, you would expect the roots to go well beyond the canopy. And when it comes to tree protection through growth and development and through construction, it's all about protecting the roots. Uh, and if you protect the roots, you can then protect the top part of the tree. But what happens is people just leave the trees thinking that they've saved them. Um, and then you have something like this, where they came and scraped off the soil, compacted the soil uh, underneath the tree, and then even parked under there. And like, that's not a tree that's gonna survive construction just because it's left standing. Um, similarly, here's a tree. It's a bit harder to tell in the photo, but this path, this driveway was put in on the far side there. And again, just right through the, that root system of the tree. Um, the tree then slowly declined over time and began dropping major limbs. The things about trees and as they go through construction, you may not see the effects for five to seven years down the line. So having that cause and effect is really difficult for some people to see. You can't confidently say, yes, this tree made it through construction until you've waited that time. And so when, at a very basic level, when we talk about protecting trees uh, during construction or during development, it usually involves just fencing off the roots and never going in there. That fence doesn't move. Uh, you fence off enough that's called the, the critical root zone, enough of the roots that would help the tree survive. And thereby fencing off those roots, it makes sure there's no impact to the minimum amount of roots that the tree would need to survive. Therefore, the top of the tree survives as well by protecting the roots. There's no um, standardized formula, but a general rule that people follow is for each inch of diameter, that would be a foot of radius <laughs> on each side. So it is fairly large and different species um, have different tolerances for construction, like post oaks are terrible at surviving construction. So that's when you would want it to be larger. Um, but that's generally the way most people do it. And it is always gonna be an estimation because there's no way for you to really know where the roots are unless you brought in some advanced equipment, which is typically just beyond the scope of what people would do. What about those trees that you had in the boulevard? Just, they were just that much wide between the sidewalk and the street, which in your picture. So if that street, was put in after the tree was there. So yes, that is an example of when they didn't protect enough space and it caused the tree to die. That's the trees you're living. And those first pictures you had. Or the the or the I, I think, I think those line. trees were probably planted after, 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 after Okay. Sure. Okay. And that, that's okay. The roots are okay then underneath all that. Right. So putting a, a tree in a smaller sort of space of soil is different than having a mature tree grow up with sort of this lots of space. So a tree will its roots as it's growing will naturally grow where it's favorable. So you would assume like the existing footprint of a house or the existing sort of confined space, you wouldn't go out as much when you have the trees developing in that more urban environment, if that makes sense. You kind of account for things. It's still amazing how a uh, space that wide, how these two feet fit. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, it's, it's impressive. All right. Um, so I wanted to spend a good amount of time talking about the municipal perspective when it comes to protecting trees. And when I say municipal perspective, I mean like the city of or the town of, or the village of, like those city governments. Um, because cities play a pretty important role when it comes to just the management of the urban forest in general. And so in this table, I have different criteria and indicators used to 
um, sort of define sustainable urban forests. And they uh, it starts with things like the vegetation resource that's about the trees themselves. The community plays a large role. But then when it comes to resource management, all of these things in that last court category are things that the city does. So that's why I'm taking this perspective for, for this next section here. Um, and I just want to point out that, that tree protection is just one component of the larger urban forestry pie uh, that uh, exists. Um, but cities can play, again, a big role through various programs um, in the management and sustainability of urban forests. Now, the exact needs of each community uh, are going to vary, as well as just community members are going to be important as well. But uh, we're going to take the view from the city now. Um, and generally, when we talk about the different tools that cities have when it comes to urban forests, we say that they fall into three categories, education, incentives, and regulation. Um, oftentimes, it is best to practice those tools in that order. Doesn't have to be, though. And so applying these tools to tree protection and tree pre preservation, here's just some examples of what these things can look like. So when it comes to education, things like educating the community about the value of trees, as well as things like educating developers how to actually protect trees during development, um, as well as building just support for trees in the community. Um, the Tree City USA program is one way to do that, which I'll talk about a little bit later. When it comes to incentives, things like creating a heritage tree list at the city level and recognizing special, important, big or historic trees in the community is one example of an incentive. Also awards and positive attention to developers who actually protect trees um, or protect um, habitat. Um, and then when it comes to regulation, that's where we talk about ordinances. Um, and we're going to go kind of into a, a deep dive into some tree regulations. But um, when it comes to tree ordinances, there's generally a few different types. Um, and they're important to distinguish between. Um, there are things like public tree care ordinances or also called street tree ordinances. Those are concerned with the city owned trees. Then there's tree protection or preservation ordinances, which we're going to talk about in a little bit. There's buffer or view ordinances that can uh, preserve a viewscape. There's landscape ordinances that say what needs to be planted after development. And then in Central Texas, I also see a lot of um, what we call disease tree ordinances, specifically around oak wilt. But I didn't put that as a major category here because that's kind of unique to um, what I see in kind of the Central Texas area. Um, now, to some ordinances and policies and regulations are probably pretty boring. Like, I apologize that we're not outside looking at trees. Um, it just involves reading a bunch of documents in a pretty bland language. But they are so incredibly important when it comes to shaping what the community looks like. And so for that reason, I think it's important for us to look at them, uh, specifically tree protection ordinances or tree TPOs is what we sometimes abbreviate those as. Um, and these ordinances are used to preserve and protect trees for the collective benefits that we talked about at the beginning of the presentation. Typically, they uh, require the landowner or tree owner to receive permission from the local municipal authority before removing trees of a certain size and or species. And so I want to take a look at kind of what these ordinances can look like and their landscape across Texas, because there's no one size fits all. No two places do this the exact same. Um, so I'm going to summarize some research from um, Lavi and Hagelman. This was done back in 2019, looking at tree protection ordinances across Texas. Now, this is from 2019, so this is not an accurate reflection of who has ordinances quite right now. Um, ordinances honestly can pop up at any time, but um, their research focused on comparing the ordinances seeing what's similar, what's different across Texas. Um, and they focused on the ordinances largely around the MSA or metropolitan statistical areas uh, because we tend to see the ordinances popping up more there as opposed uh, to areas out 
outside of that. Although, you know, we know that's not the norm all the time. But um, looking at the ordinances that exist in Texas, uh, they typically include four different things, a statement of purpose. So why protect trees? Again, like those benefits we talked at the beginning, the parameters of protection. So what trees you're gonna protect, the extent of protection, where are you going to protect trees? And then the conditions, how are you actually going to protect them? And so we're gonna take just kind of a deep dive here into those different elements, starting about the per with the parameters. So which trees should be protected? And again, it, there's a lot of variation across the state, but this is typically done on tree size for the reasons we've already discussed. Um, usually determined by diameter at breast height, that's a forestry measurement of just the diameter at four and a half feet above the ground. And uh, they found that the average initial size was six to 11 inches diameter at, a bre at breast height. There can often, although there doesn't have to be a secondary classification, uh, but typically if there is additional classifications, those are for even larger trees. Uh, and the, that's where the term heritage tree typically comes in. Now, uh, again, looking at the ordinances back in 2019, they found that the average here started at about 19 to 25 inches. So these are considerably larger trees and oftentimes trees of a specific species. So typically native trees, as well as native trees that tend to be long lived in the urban environment. So not something like a sugar berry, um, but tends to be things like oaks, pecan, hickory, things of that sort. Now, another way to define the parameters of protection, so which trees would be protected, is by a tree species list, either saying these trees are included or these trees are excluded, like invasive species. Um, then there comes even more variability when you talk about the extent of protection. So where will the trees be protected? And uh, you could choose private property, public property, developed property, undeveloped property. There could be land use exemptions for things like single family or multifamily homes um, or in the extraterritorial jurisdiction or not. Out of all the ordinances when this research is done, they found that many protect trees on undeveloped private property more than others. Um, so some protect tech trees everywhere, but out of all of them, uh, undeveloped private property was the most popular. In terms of conditions of protection, this is where you really get into the details about how the trees are gonna be protected. And this is part becomes incredibly important for reasons we're gonna talk about here in just a second. But the first thing there has to be is some sort of an exemption because not all trees that meet the parameters for protection should actually be saved a tree in poor health, a tree that is like an imminent hazard, or a tree that uh, prevents reasonable use or access to the property, you yeah. need ways to exempt that. But you can't make it too easy to become exempt. So there's a, a delicate balance. And the way this process typically works is it's done on a permitting system. So there's typically a city staff member who has expertise in trees, like a city arborist or an urban forester, uh, they determine whether to grant a permit for a tree removal of a protected tree, and that involves a site visit, actually looking at the tree, evaluating uh, the site plans and things of that sort. Oftentimes, when it comes to heritage trees, that larger protected class, those become more difficult to remove. So uh, sometimes to remove like those larger protected classes, it would need approval from city council. Uh, and there's various ways that uh, that can be implemented. Mitigation is also important because again, not every tree is uh, going to be protected. Some are going to have to be removed even if they uh, meet the criteria. Um, and so if a tree is removed, it can outline uh, rules for mitigating its loss. And this again is variable, but that could be from physical replacement based on some sort of formula from fees, from credits, or a combination of some of the above, or combination of some or all of the above, I should say. The thing about mitigation is it can't be too easy because then you just have a tree mitigation ordinance and you don't actually have a tree protection ordinance. 
Similarly with enforcement, uh, oftentimes there can be somebody who's identified to have an actual authority over enforcement and then some sort of civil or criminal punishments or even fines. Um, and again, a tree protection ordinance that isn't enforced isn't gonna protect trees. Um, so there's some really important key points that cities have to consider if they do adopt a tree protection ordinance in order to make it effective. Because tree protection ordinances can be effective, but it is entirely dependent on how that ordinance is written. But there's no template for an ordinance, so all the ordinances are gonna be a little bit different, uh, and they need to fit the needs of the community. But so there's a few things in common, like they should be administered by somebody who knows trees, like a city arborist or a city forester. Um, an ordinance must be enforceable. The support from the general community is absolutely critical. Most, or in most cases, it should be where the interest in tree protection comes from the community and then the city acts on that. Um, if a city attempts to just implement an ordinance without community support, it is very difficult. Uh, you also have to outline and you know be careful to consider what are the actual protection measures for saved trees, because it's not a, just about leaving the tree standing as well as what is actually the removal of a tree. To some ordinances and to some people, that means physically coming in and chopping the tree down. In other ordinances, like in the city of Austin, if you prune more than 25% of the canopy of a tree, that constitutes removal and would need a permit. So that was a deep dive into ordinances. Um, where can a city get started if they don't have an existing tree protection ordinance? Oftentimes, a city that doesn't have an ordinance or hasn't really been thinking about the urban forest or managing the urban forest in a meaningful way, oftentimes what I usually have them start with is the Tree City USA program. This is a program that's uh, been around quite a while from the Arbor Day Foundation, but it requires the city to meet essentially four standards. Um, they need a tree board or department, a public tree care ordinance, so it's not a protection ordinance. They have to spend a certain amount of money on trees per their population, and they have to celebrate Arbor Day. Now you'll notice there's nothing in there about protecting trees, and that's okay because the whole point of this program, I mean, it is annual recognition, you get national recognition, all that, that's great. But from my perspective, the great thing about this program is that it builds the framework for future action within the city. So it builds that framework for future program growth so that you then can tackle the more complicated things like tree protection. All right. So um, I've talked a lot about the city's perspective, gotten into some regulation through ordinances, and you might be sitting here saying like, okay, that's cool, Allison, but so what? Like, what's next? What can I do as a member of my community, or what can you do as a member of the Native Plant Society to actually protect trees? Um, and I'll start it off with this quote from the Lorax and Dr. Seuss, unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing is going to get better it's not. So I really want to emphasize that tree protection is successful in communities where the majority of people are on board. There's always going to be people opposed to it, but you really need the awareness in the community and the community has to want it. Um, so some things that you could consider doing are raising community awareness of trees. Your eventual goal is that you would have the majority of the community or you know, the general community think that they are vital to the community's well-being. You can participate in or develop projects on tree education, planting, maintenance, et cetera. Um, I heard earlier that you have some funds to spend, so you could dedicate some programs uh, related to those things. Um, as well as actually, since you are, you know, members of the community where you live, whatever community that is, you can actually serve on either a tree or parks advisory commission or board, or if your city doesn't have one, support the creation of one. And really a lot of it comes down to advocacy, being that person in your community who's going to speak for the trees and champion this cause. Um, amongst your neighbors, to your city council, 
Um, and that is really um, where good tree protection comes from. So with that, any questions? Can you give us an example? I mean, you gave us some um, wonderful um, guidelines. Mm -hmm. Can you give us an example where one city did protect something? Just trees in general? Just yeah. Um, so in the city of Austin, they have some pretty strong and successful tree protection uh, regulations. And they have, I think, like... I can't remember quite the number, but like a 95 or some number in the 90% success rate of protecting trees. And it is very much trees are protected in that community. There are other communities um, that do the same thing. I mean, they have the ordinance and the ordinance helps it to work. Now, if there's like one sort of meaningful tree in the community and no ordinance on the books, that's when things like advocacy, talking to your city leaders, uh, you know, that more of that advocacy role comes into play. Is the Treaty Oak still alive? Yes, it is still alive. Mm -hmm. And I heard it did pretty well uh, during the ice storm that there actually wasn't a lot of ice accumulation in that part of Austin. Talking about heritage trees, is there something that marks the tree like the superstore home? So it's really up to the community. Um, I'm actually reviewing right now for a project at work, like a, a tree registry from Austin that the city managed, and they uh, had these different coins and things that symbolize those trees so yes that can be done but then as a state we have a big tree registry um it's nothing physically there to mark the tree but we have a website where we list those and we have state and national champions and then there's also a historic tree commission that uh, for the state that recognizes trees again just on sort of a website rather than uh, with a physical marker i noticed that the post oak in austin as well as the post oaks out here, seem to be really struggling, particularly the old ones. And I don't know if that was because of the freezers or what. Do you have any evidence of that? Or? I mean, there's um, sort of this phenomenon of, have you heard of rapid post oak decline? So especially after like the 2011 drought and that sort of really stressful experience, uh, a lot of post oaks across the state uh, did not do well and essentially died. I would imagine that, um, you know, post oaks have just been sort of succumbing to some of the environmental pressures that we've had as of late, starting back to the 21 winter storm, all the way through the most recent drought. Um, and so I, it's typically a matter of environmental factors there. Post oaks are really sensitive to those things. They're also not great at surviving construction, but that's just a different caveat and side, um, side note there. Well, I lost all of my uh, big cedar elm after the 2011 drought. That, are they really sensitive to drought or is that or is something else going on? No, uh, cedar elm is actually a pretty tough tree. I call it one of my favorite parking lot trees because they tend to be uh, installed there because they are so tough. Um, I mean, it could have just been like 2011 is still kind of that big drought on our radar. Uh, it could have just been, you know, it really was too much of a stressful event, but there are there also are diseases that can um, impact cedar elm. So I don't know what might have caused yours, but I suspect it was likely the drought. But in general, those species tend to be pretty resilient to environmental factors. So it could have been something else. Mm -hmm. I really was fascinated because you showed the picture of the, of the root system there mm -hmm. that extended so far beyond the drip line. Yeah. And if you'll get in the weeds with me a little bit, I was taught to water the tree at the drip line, mm -hmm. but not in ignorance, I did not realize the extent of the roots. Where, where do you recommend watering the tree? So I typically also recommend the drip line just for practicalities sake. Like, um, 
in that picture, you know, we assume the roots will go out well when they have the room to grow and when it's a favorable environment. Um, but a lot of people also live in urban environments where the, the tree roots are actually physically constricted. So I would still go for watering based on the drip line just because it's more of a sure bet um, than anything else. But I don't, if you have a really large mature tree in your, in your front yard or in, at your home, I should say, uh, you, there's, you can still go beyond that. It's just, I feel like you get more bang from your buck underneath the drip line, yeah. I thought it was really interesting you stressing the importance of saving the mature tree. Mm -hmm. And I, I know if we have a wonderful advocate with Fred um, for the city of Marble Falls, he's bought tree ordinances forever and with little mm -hmm. <laughs> I gotta go back to the drawing board. Yeah. But anyway, with the developers, how, how do you, it's, it's all about the economics mm -hmm. of sitting in these large developments. Yeah. And they say, oh, well, we're going to, you know, go back and we're going to plant all of these trees. But they're taking out all the mature trees. How do you get that balance it's when it's all dollars and cents when they go in and take everything out? So that's the thing where you know, those statistics on like property value can come into play. I will say there are developers who just like will not care. Like that's not for them. They're just not going to even do it. But some of them will. And there are some communities that have been really successful at um, protecting uh, maybe just not even one tree, but just kind of like a grouping of trees for the whole community. Um, and that can help increase essentially their profits from selling the homes as well. Um, so... You know, ideally, this is where we get into education. Hopefully, you would teach them about that and they'd want to do it. Reality is some, um, no matter how much you tell them about that, just won't care, just won't do it. So then you can get things like incentives and um, having the city, you know, providing publicity, positive pub publicity to developers who actually protect trees and provide those trees. Um, but then that's where, even after that, if that doesn't work, regulation, like that's pretty much some, for, in some places, that's like the only way it's going to happen, um, which is unfortunate that not everybody thinks the way we do, but that's just kind of like the reality of it, especially given like the development boom that we have. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things that we have that we individual properties being developed and it's like the first one you're going to set it. Yeah. You're going to say there, you can have a tree in your own garden and the developer build in the next floor and they grow your own tree. So yes. You can do the same that. I mean, because often it's better as well, but it's yeah. even an owner of that home that mm -hmm. you can go and talk to with the developer and it's not the one that Yeah like you kind of mentioned, really talking to them. If you don't have any tree protection ordinances on the book or any regulations protecting that situation, there's nothing that like could really be done except having that conversation with them, offering to pay to have an arborist come and set up the tree protection fence and monitor it and say, look, your lot will benefit and my home will benefit too because we get to keep this big, beautiful tree. But Again, it's one of those those tricky things where sometimes it really just is the regulation. All the way in the back. If you have a tree protection ordinance, are the penalties generally special? Depends. <laughs> um, there, there are limits on what penalties. I can't remember what those are, but they were set by the state in terms of like actual fines. Um, for some people, it for some developers, it is sufficient. For others, it's not. As well as if it was like a, a big tree that had some value to the community, um, sometimes even that negative publicity could uh, dissuade them. But it depends, really. And it depends where you are and what kind of property value you're talking about. Um, sometimes in central Austin, no, but um, they're still very successful at, at protecting trees. The most, um, a tree preservation incident that comes to mind is mm -hmm. the highway construction where you're going to be spending 
maybe 10 years ago, when we had an actual group. Do you have any updates on the success of that? Tree moving has become, I think, a lot more popular and successful in the last decade or so, I'd say. Um, I've seen numerous large trees moved. Uh, the city of Buda actually ended up moving a large tree, not too far, just like to a different part of the lot. I don't know if you've ever been to City Hall in Buda, but they um, they paid a pretty penny to move that tree and it's still there and it's doing good. They've gotten a lot better at moving trees and there are companies in Central Texas that move a lot of trees. Uh, the UT campus is another example where they've had to move a number of trees uh, as well as in Waller Creek in Austin. They've done some there as well. But yes, it's happening. It's much better than it used to be. And that is another uh, option um, sometimes. Break those rules because they want to go. I will say that the city of Austin's tree protection ordinance doesn't apply to UT campus because it's state property and the city can't regulate on state property. Um, uh, in UT's case, I know they've moved some trees, but yes, that is something that they are actively working on right now is how to protect as many trees as they can like through development and they're working on developing uh, those sort of standards, but those are only like really standards for, for uh, the campus because again, it's state. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. There's another question, yeah. Can you tell us about the Forest Service program out in West Texas where they grow and you can buy a lot of trees, mm -hmm. trees, I think, very cheaply. Um, yes, so that it, in West Texas, we have our West Texas nursery and you can find them online just by Googling that or by going through our website. But um, they sell uh, different types of trees that we locally source from across the state. So like each fall I go out and my colleagues go out and we collect seed. <laughs> um, and then they grow those trees um, and you can buy them at essentially cost. Um, and so th these are gonna be like bare root or smaller trees which are great for planting um, and great to uh, transport and things of that sort. Uh, but yes, if you're looking for a source of those kind of smaller at times of purchase trees, the West Texas Nursery is uh, a great place to look. They ship them to you, so you don't have to go there. I should clarify that because that is in Idaloo. Yep. It varies each year, but uh, the, their stock will always be listed on, on the website. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and yeah, 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 Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, so I am a huge proponent of planting small trees at time of purchase is what I mean small. So it can still grow into a big, mature, beautiful live oak, but getting trees at the nursery or from the West Texas nursery or wherever you get them at the plant sale that look like tiny sticks in the ground. Those trees require less of your time, less water to establish. There's often to, uh, there's a lot of research out there that shows that those smaller trees at time of planting actually end up outgrowing those large gallon size uh, trees. And plus you've used less water to establish them because trees, even if a tree says that it's, um, you know, a drought tolerant tree, it's not drought tolerant until you establish it, right? So they need to be watered much like your, your house plants at least once a week for the first few years. And that time extends the larger the tree is when you purchase it. So I'm a huge proponent of planting small trees. The best ones look like just tiny sticks in the ground. Uh, not in height, but no, no, diameter. No, no, no. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. How old are those? Those are typically like the small saplings. They are typically bare root. Sometimes we have ones in parter in larger sizes. 
I think in generally one year or two years, I'm not quite sure on that exact, exact specific, but um, the ones that they ship out are usually bare root, meaning that they don't even come, oops, sorry, in a pot, um, but they are those kind of just look, they look like little sticks in the ground. And sometimes we have largers just depending on the year and what we grew in the back. I was wondering, are there grants available to so um, in terms of actually sourcing trees, things like the West Texas Nursery are, are great for that because um, they're at cost. When it comes to grants, would you be applying as like a nonprofit or neighborhood group? Are you applying as the Native Plant Society or, or what entity would be applying? Because we do offer um, grants, we don't have any available right now, but we anticipating having some available later this year and for the next five years. I don't have any details on what those are going to be yet, but places like nonprofits, city governments, education institutions can all apply to those. Okay. Mm -hmm. And Allison, on one other technical question, Freeze at Home Depot at the big box store that the genus species might not be the correct one for our area. Did you mm -hmm. that? Yeah. So um, as a member of the state agency, I can't tell you which businesses to shop or not shop okay. at. However, what I can say is I generally love to support local businesses. Uh, selecting the right tree to plant for your planting site is incredibly important. Uh, we all know, I'm sure, as the Native Plant Society, that our native trees with local seed source are going to be uh, better adapted to, to that environment. Um, I will also say, though, too, just selecting the correct, even if you get the right species, selecting good quality stock is incredibly important so when you go to a nursery whether it's a big box store or not if the tree is in a pot which most of our trees come containerized or container grown take the pot off and look at the roots and if they don't want you taking the pot off go somewhere else because uh, you need to look at the roots uh, you want to be sure to avoid roots that are too circling that's where the roots hit the edge and then they start circling because if those aren't corrected or if those are too bad when the tree is planted they never self-correct and so we see a lot of trees either falling over or slowly declining after like 10, 15 years because their root system was poor, or it was never corrected. So I can tell you that about nurseries and I could do a whole presentation on tree selection uh, in terms of species and then nursery tree selection as well, if that was ever of interest. Usually a good topic for the fall, yeah. Let's get one more question and then, then we're gonna talk. One last one. In translation, I'm, I'm, I'm reading that fall planting, there were. Uh, fall planting, just any stock. Uh, tree planting season in Central Texas uh, is best late fall, or excuse me, late October through the end of March. Any stock, any kind of stock. That's just across the board. Um. Yeah. Okay, thank you.